Hi everyone, welcome to Physionic, where we learn the body from the macro to the micro. As you can see by the title, we'll be spotlighting Dr. Jason Fung. Learn your body, a science-based education. I've gotten a number of requests to delve into the scientific accuracy of Dr. Fung, so that is what I will be doing here. If you're not familiar with who I am and you're a Jason Fung enthusiast, I'm a researcher in an autophagy lab and I'm currently pursuing my PhD in molecular medicine. Assuming you care about scientific fact over fandom, I hope what I present to you will help set the record straight on Jason Fung's beliefs. At the get-go, I'll have you know that I went through this interview and I agreed with Dr. Fung on four subjects and I disagreed with him on three subjects. On the areas I disagree, I will be providing studies and explanations. With that introduction, let's see what Dr. Fung has to say on fasting and autophagy. First, he discusses fasting and its effect on blood sugar. Yeah, and did you notice blood sugar regulation improved commensurate with the weight loss or was that after the fact? Like, because you're working with yeah, diabetics. Type the 2 diabetes, the, the blood sugar often gets better before a lot of the weight is lost. Mm -hmm. So you can often pull people off of their medications, take them off of their insulin and so on. And that's one of the, the things that you have to be careful about is that you don't take the same dose of all your medications, especially if they're diabetic medications, and change your diet at the same time. Mm -hmm. Because of course there's a risk that your sugars go too low. And luckily I'm able to monitor that and advise patients and uh, that sort of thing. But yeah, absolutely. Blood sugar comes down. It's not really that hard to understand. You don't eat, your blood sugar comes down, right? So mm. nothing hard about it. This first point is well taken. I agree. The literature does follow the same thought process. If a person fasts, their blood sugar does decrease almost immediately, as the source of energy to be used first is blood glucose, or blood sugar. He brings up a good point that one would need to reduce any medications that, for lack of better words, artificially reduce blood sugar because the physiological reduction plus an artificial reduction can lead to serious problems where blood sugar dips too low, known as hypoglycemia. He addresses this a bit further next. Yeah. What about hypoglycemia? Uh, so yeah, I mean, that's the major risk, right? So if you're taking blood sugar medications, then you may go hypoglycemic, right? The question is if you're not taking um, medication, so for somebody who's either not diabetic or diabetic but not taking medications, there's always this worry, oh, you're going to hypoglycemic. Well, no, that's not how the world works, right? And this is the same thing. So if, and people always tell you these crazy, crazy things about fasting. Yeah. Um, one of them is uh, you'll go hypoglycemic and like die or something, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, if that was true, then, uh, 100, 200 years ago and it was winter and you're living in a cave somewhere and there's no food, you don't eat for a couple days, well you go hypoglycemic and die, right? That's what happens to all the lions and the tigers and the bears, they all just have seizures and die, right? No, it's like, come on, that's just ridiculous, right? If you actually measure the blood sugar of people who fast, it typically goes down a bit, then stays in that normal range. Mm. And every single study like, has, has shown the same thing. The reason is your body will produce some of the sugar. The other thing it will do, of course, is reduce the need for sugar. So your body, your, most of your muscles, for example, will start burning fat. Your brain, which cannot, the body produces ketone bodies, and the ketone bodies will pro pro provide most of the energy needed for the brain. So you do need a little bit of glucose, but luckily you can get that from your body fat as well. He discusses how a person won't go hypoglycemic in normal situations, aside from the inclusion of medicine. Again, he's right. Other than his odd explanation of time, wherein he mentions that people lived in caves 100 years ago, he does a great job explaining this process simply. The brain does use ketones after a few days of fasting. The muscles do use more fatty acids, that's fat molecules, and the liver generates more glucose by using another section of the fat molecule known as glycerol. All that is spot on. And everybody knows it's false, so, but this is the thing, right? There's these truths that get passed on and they get repeated so often that no matter how stupid they are, people believe them because they've right. been repeated over and over. It's like the calories thing, right? Oh, cut your calories, you'll lose weight. Has it worked for anybody, right? No, not really. 
I don't think it's ever worked, right? The studies have proved it, right? So it's like, why do we think that cutting calories will make you lose weight? Because everybody says so. That's the only reason. Is there any randomized trial? No. Okay, here we go. At this point in the interview, I'm thinking Dr. Fung seems to have a good head on his shoulders. He's intelligent, clearly. And then this statement comes out of left field. Cutting calories won't lead to weight loss. Other than anecdotally, where, and I can tell you, I've dropped over 50 pounds by counting calories and have maintained that weight loss over five years at this point, let's look at this lack of randomized trials, according to Dr. Fung. Well, here's one, two, three controlled trials showing the exact opposite being true. In each study, participants, men and women, overweight and normal weight, lost weight and body fat by simply cutting calories. This held true for longer time periods, like years as well. Now look, I get that diets can often lead to rebound in weight gain, but that's not because of reducing calories isn't effective, it's because people stop tracking or track less effectively. I won't deny there are physiological factors that make sticking to a weight loss nutrition harder, but the calorie is outside of body physiology. It is a physical law of thermodynamics. So if you ignore the physiological cues to eat more and you're forced to eat only a prescribed caloric amount determined to result in weight loss, you will lose weight. He's wrong here. You mentioned muscle loss. I think that's a big uh, hurdle or mental hurdle for a lot of people because the, you know people are interested in like fine tuning their health. They're generally active. They're exercising, doing CrossFit, weightlifting. We know that muscle is anti-aging. It's where insulin stores onto and so forth. Um, you have a great argument as to why it's it's so silly that to think that you would lose all this muscle when you do intermittent fasting. Yeah, and this is the thing. Again, people who have a little bit of knowledge sometimes extrapolate and it's not really warranted. So there's differences in terms of uh, what happens. So as you fast, you will start with the glycogen. So your, your liver, so glycogen is change of glucose. So as you eat, you fill up your glycogen stores and these are all chains of glucose. And that lasts anywhere from 24 to 36 hours, right? So if you don't eat for 24 hours, for the most part, you have enough glucose in your liver you simply break all those the glycogen back into little chains of sugar and just send it back out. So you're not burning muscle and everybody kind of knows that. Um, at the other extreme, if you're fasting for more than about 36 hours or so, you're burning mostly fat. But there's a window in there where you do this so-called gluconeogenesis where you use protein to kind of um, produce glucose. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where people say, wow, you're going to lose, and I've heard these numbers, oh, you're going to lose a quarter pound of muscle for every day you fast. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, again, you'd have to realize that if you believe that, then you'd have to believe that Mother Nature designed our bodies to store food energy as fat and sugar, but when we actually need it, to burn protein. Right? It's like, okay, well, that sounds pretty dumb, right? No system would work very well if it was designed that way. If you had, it's like you store firewood for your wood burning oven, mm. but as soon as you need it, you chop up your sofa and throw it into the fire. It's like, why would you do that? Here, he's describing what happens at varying stages of fasting and how it doesn't affect your muscles much. Here, again, I agree with him. First, your body cells use glycogen from the liver, which is a chain together glucose or carbohydrate molecules that are freed from their single molecule form, known as glucose, as opposed to their chained glycogen form. These glucose molecules are released from the liver and used by other cells. After a while, the amino acids that make up proteins can also be used for glucose production by the liver leading to a maintenance of blood glucose, sugar, levels by gluconeogenesis. After some time, your body cells, especially muscle cells, do begin focusing their metabolism on fat metabolism as opposed to carbohydrate glucose metabolism. I also really like his analogy on firewood and the couch. It's a comical and illustrative way to get the right point across. And if you go back to studies of fasting, so it's like if you think you're going to lose muscle while fasting, then do the study. Fast people measure their muscle mass yeah. at the end of it. Don't look at urea kinetics and all this stuff because that's not your question. I didn't ask you about urea kinetics. So urea is the breakdown product of uh, protein. Mm -hmm. 
do the study where you take somebody, you fast, measure their muscle mass. Is it changed? And it's like when you compare them, no, they're not much change. Right. I mean, obviously, it depends. Again, if you are very obese versus if you're very lean, then it's different too. Okay. So a very obese person will burn much more fat percentage-wise than a lean person. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Again, the body's just not that stupid, right? So the the estimates is an obese person will burn about ninety percent of their calories as fat, whereas the lean person is down at seventy eight. So they are burning more protein. His next point is another one I agree with. He makes a great point that if you're able to measure the tissue directly, in this case muscle, go ahead and do that. Don't use proxy measurements like urea, which is the breakdown product of proteins by the liver. Then he goes on to discuss that overweight individuals use more fat when they drop weight than a leaner person, leading the leaner person to potentially use more amino acids from proteins. Again, correct. If you've been keeping count, at this point you know I'm going to disagree on everything else he says. So if you're a fan, brace yourself and be prepared to send your hate comments irrespective of my points. Now, he switches gears to discuss autophagy. It's another component. And the other thing is that not all that protein is good, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody has this inherent bias that all that protein is uh, really good stuff, right? Well, there's all kinds of situations where that protein is not good stuff, right? So for example, in Alzheimer's disease, there's all this abnormal protein gumming up your brain and that's why you can't think, right? Well, what if you had a process which could actually break down this junky old protein and get rid of it? Well, that's what fasting does. Because again, your body's like, oh, I'm not getting any nutrients here. Uh, let me look for any of the junky old proteins that I don't need. Mm -hmm. Let me break them down. And that process is called autophagy. And it's been a super hot topic because the 2016 Nobel Prize in Medicine went to one of the pioneers of research in autophagy. Mm. It's super important because you can, theoretically, prevent all kinds of disease, cancers, for example, because all those cancerous cells, they need glucose, they're gonna die, but also your body's gonna target them, say, what the hell is this? Let's mm. burn it for energy. Here, he mentions that the body uses fasting to get rid of junky proteins. He's referencing amyloid plaques in Alzheimer's, which are proteins that build up in the brain. Now, he also mentions the body looks around for these proteins, and he makes it seem like the body searches for these proteins specifically, which, if that's the case, is not true. The body, in a catabolic state, a breakdown state, generally destroys proteins known as proteolysis. It doesn't sit around and organize a plan to save your brain from beta amyloid specifically, although it may help generally. He mentions the name of the process specifically autophagy, and he references cancer cells, but unfortunately he's wrong here as well. One, because autophagy is an internal process, so it occurs inside the cells, and plenty of cancer types have either disabled autophagy or have extremely high levels of autophagy to maintain themselves. Here's a scientific review to check out. If autophagy could kill cancer cells in such a general manner, we'd have an easy treatment for all cancers. Might fasting help with certain cancers though? Sure, but it isn't universal. This isn't even to mention certain cancers do not rely on glucose, but prefer fat for their metabolism, which would mean an upregulation in fat metabolism in the body might promote faster cancer growth, known as the inverse Warburg effect, but that's another day. And finally, he discusses the molecular control within cells of autophagy. One of the questions came up about, so autophagy, it takes like, they were asking, is it 36 hours, 48 hours? I haven't looked at that particular research. It actually depends on mammalian target of rapamycin. That's one of the big, uh, which is called mTOR. So mTOR is a major regulator of autophagy. And it's actually protein that is the big turnoff, right? So what happens is that mTOR is essentially a nutrient sensor. It kind of senses how much nutrients are coming in. Mm -hmm. So if, if you have a little bit of protein, it actually kind of senses that very, very quickly. And the mTOR is what 
turns on and on off autophagy. So you could be fasting, and so if one of the things we use is bone broth, and it has a lot of protein, if you want autophagy, then it may be best not to use it, because mm -hmm. you may turn off that kind of autophagy. Um, so you, on the other hand, theoretically, and there's not a lot of research into this, right? But theoretically, you could eat pure fat and still get autophagy, right? Hmm. So if you ate zero carbs, because again, it's not the calories, it's not a calorie sensor, it's a protein sensor. Here, he's describing how autophagy is controlled by a master protein, or molecule known as mTOR. And he's right, mTOR is a key regulator of autophagy. When mTOR is active, autophagy is reduced. And then he goes on to mention that mTOR is a protein sensor, not an energy sensor. And that isn't right. mTOR does sense increase in protein amino acids entering the cell, shutting off autophagy. And it can also sense the energy state of the cell through ATP, which is the commonly called energy currency of the cell. As ATP or cell energy increases, mTOR activity increases as it senses more ATP. This then inhibits autophagy. Okay, but that plays into Dr. Fung's overall point, but it doesn't in a number of key ways. One, mTOR can conversely detect low ATP levels and be inhibited, increasing autophagy. Two, there's another master protein called AMP activated kinase, or AMPK, which controls mTOR, and AMPK is activated by a lack of energy. So if energy levels decline in the cell, AMPK senses this, shuts off mTOR, and stimulates autophagy. But it can also do this independent of mTOR, making mTOR not the only potent autophagy regulator. Okay, we've been at this a while, but I hope you learned a thing or two, and I hope you feel more secure in your understanding of fasting and autophagy between the two of us. Overall, Dr. Fung gets a lot of things right, and he just gets some things wrong, but sometimes quite wrong. Still, I'm sure he's helped many people, and that's fantastic. So consider this a scientific check to make sure that everyone is on the same page, and an encouragement to follow the science above all. I hope this was helpful and informative, and I hope to have the pleasure of speaking with you in the near future. Cheers.